reasoned was probably the area which makes us reason, oh well, it won't do any harm if I take more than the fair share because I deserve it, after all I'm cleverer and I'm a more wily dealer and you know, there's only one way to get ahead in life and that's to take, take, take. If you deactivate this little chunk of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, again, just like making people make decisions very, very quickly, you make less selfish decisions in terms of d dividing the split. So this to me suggests that from a neuroscience perspective, we are, at our core, a very equitable species. It is our natural instinct to share equally with others because throughout human history, our fate was so closely intertwined with that of others around us that it made sense. What's good for them will automatically make them feel like doing something nice back to you. Think of the last time you received a gift out of the blue. Someone just did something really nice for you and they had no thought for what you might do to them in return. It feels great, right? It, it feels really nice to be on the receiving end of a benevolent offer. And the first thing that most people think of when they're on the receiving end of a nice <laughs> unexpected reward is how can I reciprocate? What can I do to give back? How can I help this person back? And maybe not now, but sometime in the future. Some people are happy to, to not even worry about helping that specific person back. But if you generally have a sort of kind disposition and you help other people in general, then that, you know, this idea of pay it forward, it will encourage, it will incentivize such generous charitable behaviors such that it becomes propagated through your collective society. And indeed, uh, behavioral dynamics computations, a very hardcore area of science, where they look at interactions between multiple groups rather than the one-on-one -on -one that's usually studied has shown quite conclusively that when it comes to making multiple transactions across lots of borders, if a state or a person is surrounded by people who cooperate and who reciprocate the trust, then it can spread and it can exist. exist. But in these mathematical models, once one of these units or states is surrounded by people or states who routinely default on that trust, then cooperation dies. So it's really important, it always has been, that we surround ourselves by people who also believe in the long-term benefits for everyone of cooperation. Now, although I've been banging on a lot about how the lens of science can really help us better understand the seven deadly sins, there is something that science does terribly. Science is great at identifying how the seven deadly sins can make us act in an antisocial way and it can also do a great job of kind of getting to the root cause of all sorts of other things but what it can't do is solve the situation. I'd argue that religions are much better equipped to give people, a, a complete stranger, very quickly a sense of belonging in that place of worship. Yeah, but no. none of this has got anything to do with science, has it? Where, where, where does science come into it? Because have you just turned up? I've been speaking about science for the last half an no, hour. I don't, you keep using the word science, but what's science got to do I with I have described greed five... And lust and they're not, they're just behaving. I'm sorry, sir. It, you either weren't listening or you weren't here. I have, I have in detail described psychological, neuroscience and psychiatric studies detailing all of the things you just accused me of having not covered. It has all Never been science. It has all been science. Now, sir, hold your tongue, please. So. No, I won't hold my tongue. Don't tell people to hold their tongue. Well, you'll have to listen to me as well. I'm afraid that's what happens here. No. Ah, if you, you don't listen, up? sir, you have no right to this. Well, I can ask questions as well. That's oh, what goes on here. You can't ask don't questions. Don't tell people if you to be don't quiet. Listen. You have no right to ask Aren't questions you angry now? if you do not What's listen. What's the science of anger then? Well, I already covered it earlier. If you've been listening, so well, stop. Religion is brilliant. If you feel alone, if you feel stuck in life, and you think, you know what, I'm going to give religion a go. You could walk into a mosque, you could walk into a synagogue, you could walk into a church or a temple, and so long as you are humble and you convince them that you are genuinely, genuinely interested in the teachings of that faith, before long, those people, some of them, would explain to you what their belief system is all about. They would give you the holy book and offer you the chance to study it, right? 
within a few weeks, if you turned up on a weekly basis, on a Friday, a Saturday or a Sunday, I would wager that you would go from feeling socially isolated to like you belong to a community. Science can't really offer you that. If you go into a science lecture feeling alone, feeling socially isolated, and therefore vulnerable to the physical and mental health problems that result from that, you're gonna leave that lecture having learned a fair bit, but you will feel no closer to your fellow man. And this is where science really needs to sort its act out. Or maybe it's just communities. Maybe it's just the secular community. Has to be able to offer people more belonging, more purpose than just the pub on a Friday night or the sports team that you meet up with once a week to practice, once a week to play the game with. And obviously that's injury dependent, as, I, as my knee can tell you, or my hip or my ankle. We need to find a way to bring the worlds of religion and the worlds of science together completely to create something. Things, surely they are not. I'm sorry. I'm you're, like, you're, th you're, I'm sorry you're, I spoke you're talking about one thing you. that's based purely on faith, and the other thing that's based on proof. True. So True. how Religion can they be, isn't based on faith. How can they come together then? How can they come together? Compromise is one example. Can I can I give an example? Compromise. Say Please. in a church, and you have. Well, there's 150 people in a congregation yes. with, um, you know, one father. And that, uh, that correlates quite closely to a tribe yep. back in, you know, early hunter-gatherer yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think that's a coincidence. Okay, so uh, let me just reiterate for those who couldn't hear. This gentleman just made a very good point. The size of your average Christian congregation is about 150 people. And that is a number of people where if you go beyond it, naturally, it will disband into smaller groups. So this number, 150, it's not just random, it's not arbitrary, it's called the Dunbar number. And in tribes that listen, uh, that live in this day and age, according to old school Stone Age hunter-gathering practices, if the, if, the, if the tribes who band together go larger than that, they will fracture, they will naturally halve up and go their separate ways. And it seems like congregations of most churches, maybe not the super churches in the States, but most churches or temples, they're, they're, if they're community-based, they will tend to balance at about 150 people. Now to go beyond it, as I said before, so long as there's a God that you know is looking down and adjudicating on those people who default from the agreed rules of that social collection, then people will play, will err on the side of caution and play by the rules, even if there's no other humans around to catch them out. The problem is, science has kind of eroded this belief in God, whereby people are worried about going to hell because who wants to burn in for all eternity? And they're no longer incentivized by heaven because if you don't believe in God, heaven or hell, that whole system breaks down. Well, so what are we going to replace it with? 